2016 marked the end of one of the strongest El Nino events ever recorded. It triggered unprecedented floods in South America. Northern Europe witnessed heavy flooding too. But all that was to change several months later as the planet experienced the hottest August on record. Extreme droughts in several regions sparked massive wildfires. The high surface temperature of the oceans fueled severe storms in the Atlantic and the Pacific. We had for the first time in the Atlantic two intense hurricanes at the same time that had not been seen before. We can predict those storms, but we still can't foresee one of the planet's most lethal natural disasters, earthquakes. We've seen a number of medium-sized disasters which may cost billions to tens of billions of dollars. Using only professionally shot footage capturing the heart of the action, this film presents the major natural disasters of 2016, from the least deadly to the most dramatic. In southern France, the summer of 2016 will remain in memory as the driest on record. Rain levels were the lowest recorded since 1950, with only two inches falling on average during the months of July and August. In the Provence region, rainfall was zero. Not a drop of rain fell during the summer. As a consequence, the region's lakes, veritable oasis for people and animals alike, were no longer fed by rivers and streams that had dried up. This is how those same rivers looked in August 2015. This lack of rain, coupled with very hot temperatures, meant the amount of humidity in the ground was at a record low. Proof of that comes in the situation witnessed at the Besse sur Isole Lake in the Var region, which for the first time in its history almost completely dried up. This is how it should look. This is what the lake and its inhabitants became in the summer of 2016. Plant life is made vulnerable, dried and stressed by these extreme weather conditions. It can catch fire with the slightest spark. Added to this was a devastating phenomenon, the wind. Known locally as the Mistral, this violent wind dries the surrounding air and fans fires. The Mistral can provoke fires to unimaginable proportions. Flames dozens of feet high rip through the trees and plants and scorch roads. On the 10th of August, 1,500 firemen were called in to tackle a huge wildfire near Vitrol, just outside of Marseille. They fought from the ground and from the air. But at night, 
the firefighting planes cannot fly. Only the firemen on the ground can continue the battle. On the front line, wind gusts can push flames at speeds of tens of miles an hour. such that even plant roots underground are reduced to ash. In total, 2016 will remain a record year for fires, with 355 fires starting and nearly 12,000 acres scorched in the Bouche du Rhône department alone. No casualties are reported, but the total cost of damage reached some $3 million. The indirect consequence of these fires is the growth potential of the trees, which will be weakened for the coming years. Infested by insects and other climatic stress factors, certain will die months after the fire. These endemic tree species are replaced by an invasive pine species, but in certain areas, Frequent fires prevent trees from reaching the age of sexual maturity. The trees disappear progressively, leaving a scrubland vegetation to grow in their place. But these scorched areas in France are minor, compared to the huge fire that took place in May at Fort McMurray in Canada. The fire began southwest of Fort McMurray on May 1st, but on May 3rd, it swept through the community and was burning out of control on Highway 63. Tens of thousands of people were forced to evacuate in an emergency in the largest wildfire evacuation in the history of the state of Alberta. The fire became large enough to create a firestorm with lightning and its own storm force winds. Over a million acres of forest and 2,500 houses went up in smoke. Incredibly, there were no direct victims caused by the fire, but it is to date the most expensive natural disaster in Canada's history, with insured damage reaching $4.7 billion. Is such a disaster linked to global warming? If we have extended dry periods, um, and especially after a wet winter when the vegetation uh, creates a lot of fuel, we can have wildfires. And, and when the wind gets above uh, uh, some speed, there's nothing you can do to stop a wildfire. We've seen this situation in the past few years in, in California. We've seen it in Greece. We've seen it in Portugal. We've seen it in the southern France. We saw it late spring in Canada. And you simply have to wait for the wind to change direction or to blow the fire back on itself to uh, to, to extinguish it. So th this is something we've seen this year, and we'll see more of these in the future, especially around the Mediterranean as it gets warmer and drier. In the Southern Hemisphere, the climate also provoked a catastrophe of unusual proportions in the capital city of Paraguay, Asuncion, which lies on the banks of the Paraguay River. At the beginning of the year, torrential rainfall affected the river's catchment area in Paraguay and the surrounding countries. From late December, heavy rains, driven by a strong El Nino, increased river levels in Paraguay, Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil. But what exactly is El Nino? The El Nino phenomenon, which owes its name to the period it normally arrives at, right around Christmas time, comes from the nickname of Jesus Christ in Spanish, El Nino. 
This recurring phenomenon begins when warm water in the western tropical Pacific Ocean shifts eastward along the equator towards the coast of South America. During an El Nino, the Pacific's warmest surface waters sit offshore of northwestern South America. The rising temperatures in the East Pacific move the rain from the east of the basin, so it creates rain anomalies and very rainy phenomena, with flooding on the east coast of South America. In Asuncion at the beginning of January, Flooding forced over 150,000 people from their homes. Parts of Asuncion had already been experiencing flooding since November. By mid-December, the levels of the Paraguay River had reached over 20 feet, the highest of the year at that time, and well above the 18 feet considered to be the critical stage. Many feared the worst. Thousands were evacuated from neighborhoods along the river as levels of the Paraguay rose to 26 feet on January 7th. Every year, the flooding gets worse. It's a place where the river keeps getting bigger and higher, and recently it's been out of control. In December, I couldn't get here. Today, I made the effort to come for my father. You see, it's not easy to get to. It's an area that's very prone to flooding. And it gets worse and worse with the rain coming from Brazil and Argentina. It's hard because we have to make a lot of sacrifices. People always think that this time will be the last time, but it keeps on happening. History repeats itself. People start rebuilding, and almost before they finished, it starts again, and everything is washed away. My father has his whole life here, his animals, his family. He doesn't want to leave. Around 6,000 families were affected in the first weeks of December. But when river levels jumped to over 23 feet, these numbers doubled. 13,000 families were hit by flooding, most of them from the poor Los Bañados area of the city, located close to the river. The government of Paraguay declared a state of emergency in Asuncion and seven other regions of the country similarly affected. El Nino events occur irregularly, roughly every two to seven years, and last from 12 to 18 months, bringing with them risks of repeated flooding in vulnerable areas and the danger of outbreaks of cholera and malaria. The water didn't get as far as the house. It rose bit by bit, but then it came all at once. It was the same in 1974 or 75. This year, we've been flooded twice. The water came up to the wall. The mark was almost 30 feet. We're prepared to stay because I like my life here. The problem is the bathroom, the light, and illnesses. At least 200 pylons were damaged in the rains, leaving thousands without electricity and four people were killed by falling trees in what has been called the worst flooding in 50 years. The government immediately made $3.5 million available to help those who had been affected. A few months later, an unusual meteorological event took place in Europe. In May 2016, 
a high pressure system lingered over Northern Europe, bringing sunny and dry weather, while Central Europe felt the effects of a low pressure system. This brought rain, a lot of rain. Days of heavy rain in late May and early June caused serious problems across Europe, particularly in France and Germany. In France, some of the worst flooding seen in a century was reported. In certain areas, six weeks' worth of rain fell in three days. The events that we saw this summer are part of a natural cycle, even though they are rare, and extreme and dramatic. They are nonetheless part of a natural cycle and we can't attribute them to global warming or El Nino. In Paris in early June, the Seine reached levels that hadn't been seen for over 30 years. For the past 200 years, the Zouave statue on the Alma Bridge has been used by Parisians to symbolically measure the level of the Seine River. The river rose to 20 feet, the biggest flooding event in the capital since 1982, when waters rose to just over 20 feet. But they didn't reach the levels of the historic 1910 flood at 28 feet. The rise in water levels forced several of the capital's museums, including the Louvre and the Musée d'Orsay, to move some of their collections to safety and public transport to take precautions for the metro. When the level of the Seine hit 16 feet, authorities put emergency procedures into action, stopping the circulation of some trains. The flooding in Paris was caused by very heavy rainfall in the east of France. These same rains caused another famous French monument to end up with its feet in the water. The famous Chambord Castle flooded when the Cousson River spilt over its banks at the same time as the Paris floods. The royal court and the formal garden of Francois I's castle were completely submerged. We could see that this was going to be an event with unpredictable consequences. So we evacuated some houses that were beginning to flood a house in the woods, a rental property, and a house near the monument. The next day, Wednesday, we cut off the electricity to the bottom part of the castle. Five feet of water had risen into the cellar, and also the level of the moat was up to the courtyard. This castle is an impressive construction. In fact, the keep that we're next to here was built and raised to be three feet above the ground level. So the builders must have calculated the possible levels of flood water from the river Coso. It's a work of genius. And it's surprising and indeed touching that five centuries later, it has withstood a once in a lifetime weather event, something that we'd never seen before. Not far from Chambord, at tour en sologne water levels hit five feet. Many people were surprised in the night by the floodwaters. My mother is 79. Luckily, my brother was eating at my mother's house, and he saw an inch or so at 10 p.m., an inch or so of water. He said, OK, we'll lift up the furniture, so they put everything on blocks. They tried to save some things, and put some things upstairs. So my mother went to stay with my brother, luckily, 79 years old. Our neighbor, José, didn't have the same luck because he woke up in the water. The bed was floating. Well, the car, the Super 5, isn't that super anymore. Everyone was surprised. We couldn't save anything, nothing at all. This has never happened before. My mother in 80 years has never seen anything like this. There's never been flooding like this. A flood like this is extraordinary. For farmers in the region, 
the flooding had disastrous consequences. It's hard to imagine that there's a field of corn there. It's uh, a lovely square lake. <laughs> the firemen arrived and said, you all need to get out, otherwise everyone's going to die. So that made us panic a bit. The water was already at three feet. It was quite hard when we arrived at the end and we realized that we could have been trapped very, very quickly by the water. We didn't know what would happen and we were scared and realized the extent of the flooding. We could see the huge power of the water and with the current, we realized that we could easily have become trapped. And two days later, well, that really floored me. We came back to the farm and we could see the extent of the damage. We saw that the wheat, in fact, the water had gone over the top of the wheat, so that means there'll be nothing, nothing to harvest, and the garden's the same. Last year it flooded a little bit, but this time everything was underwater. The strawberries had formed, there were red strawberries, already formed strawberries underwater for a few days. You don't need to be a farmer to know that that's not a good sign. No? Late flooding like that is very rare. In terms of the Kosson River, this is a 100-year flood, the flood of the century. Four people died and 42 were injured across the country. The cost of the flooding in France has been estimated at 800 million euros. But temperate rainstorms like these are less organized, less dramatic, and less dangerous than tropical ones. As the climate changes and gets warmer, ocean temperatures also increase. And warm oceans fuel hurricanes and typhoons. In 2016, Taiwan was particularly badly hit by typhoons, just as new research pointed to the fact that the power of these destructive storms has increased by 50% over the past 40 years. The Pacific typhoon season started late in 2016, with the first named tropical storm, Nepartak, only developing on July 3rd. The storm began its life as an area of low pressure over the eastern Caroline Islands on June 30th. On July 5th, it was upgraded to typhoon status. By the end of the day, with sea temperatures over 30 degrees Celsius in the Philippine Sea, Nepartak was declared a super typhoon. It reached peak intensity near Taitung on the southeast coast of Taiwan, with wind pressure at 900 millibars and maximum sustained winds of 125 miles per hour. Nepartak crossed over Taiwan on July 7th. eastern side it has big mountains and not very many people live on the on the east almost all the activity the economic activity the big cities all the almost all the people in the buildings are concentrated on the western side of the island the lowland side of the island and most typhoons they come from the direction of the southeast and so they tend to hit the mountains first Nepartak caused three deaths in Taiwan but went on to cause 83 deaths in China and a total of $1.5 billion worth of damage. Three months later, a second typhoon hit Taiwan. Named Maranti, it was the strongest tropical cyclone worldwide in 2016 
and one of the most intense tropical cyclones on record. The storm formed west of Guam in the Western Pacific Ocean. On September 11th, it was upgraded to typhoon status, rapidly intensifying on September 12th and becoming a Category 5 super typhoon with maximum sustained wind speeds recorded at 150 miles per hour and a minimum barometric pressure of 890 millibars. Naranti clipped the southern end of Taiwan. Two people were killed, and over 700,000 homes lost water and electricity. The storm went on to destroy nearly 300 houses in the Philippines and kill some 30 people in flood-related events in China. On September 21st, again near Guam, a tropical depression formed, becoming Typhoon Megi on September 23rd. The typhoon reached peak intensity as a Category 3 typhoon, this time over the island itself, making landfall at Huailin City on the Pacific east coast of Taiwan, with maximum sustained winds of 100 miles per hour and a barometric pressure of 940 millibars. Giant waves battered the coast as Megi landed, leaving over three million households without power in the second worst blackout in the country's history. However, given the size of the waves, the damage was not nearly as bad as it could have been. The last of these typhoons brought um, quite high wind speeds, so wind speeds that in most countries would have been quite damaging to, uh, to Taiwan, uh, in particular to the main port at Kiaosiang in, in Taiwan. It brought very high winds, but it didn't do a very large amount of damage because the buildings in Taiwan are quite, quite well built. As the storm's eye passed over the island, the winds changed direction. Megi forced more than 14,000 people to evacuate to government shelters from mountainous areas near the coast. Even though Taiwan and southern China are well prepared for such events, 91 people died, and the total cost of these extremely destructive typhoons has been estimated at $1.25 billion. Researchers are warning that these giant storms will become even stronger in the future, threatening the large and growing coastal populations of Pacific nations. These inhabitants are also under threat from less dramatic events. We see the disasters, the big impact disasters, the disasters that, that get the headlines in the paper, and we, we can put a, an estimate as to how much the damage costs of the big famous disasters, if you like, but there's, there's what we call insidious risk, insidious disasters, when the things are moving slowly, which are, we know, already starting to cause loss and will cause much more loss in the future. And the biggest of these is sea level rise. So sea level rise is happening at about three millimeters per year at present. But well, one estimate we have for what the consequences of sea level rise are going to be is that um, in 2006, there was an estimate that there was one trillion dollars, so a million million dollars, of value located within one meter of sea level. That's because if you think about all the things which exist at sea level, ports, power stations, hotels, petrochemical refineries, uh, airports, all sorts of things have built themselves to be just above sea level. And if sea level moves, they're all, they are all gonna have to be relocated. Other events are likely to become more devastating as a direct consequence of human population growth. 2016 illustrates the challenge of living on a tectonically active planet. The Pacific Ocean is circled by a network of tectonic fault lines and volcanoes known as the Ring of Fire. To the northwest of this ring are Honshu and Kyushu, Japan's most populated islands, which lie at the junction of several plates. 
The Philippine plate collides with several Eurasian plates, creating a fault line that loops under the islands from southwest to east. At the extreme south of this zone, the Kumamoto district is built on layers of rock. Every year, dozens of tremors are felt in this area. In April 2016, a series of earthquakes hit the Kumamoto area, including a magnitude 7 main shock on April 16th. It was centered around 60 miles southeast of Sendai, close to the site of the devastating quake and tsunami that struck in March 2011. These earthquakes in Kyushu, they weren't located on the subduction zone plate boundary. They were located on a zone of, where there's a lot of active faulting running down the middle of Kyushu. Roads were damaged, and thousands of homes were destroyed in the earthquake. Between the 14th and the 20th of April, the area experienced more than 600 aftershocks, including two very strong ones. 15,000 soldiers from the Japan Self-Defense Forces joined relief efforts. The main priority we have at the moment is looking for people and saving them. And to be honest, it's been very frustrating because we can't do anything at all for the moment. The aftershocks keep continuing. We need to be very careful because nature isn't making us feel very optimistic. As well as destroying houses and buildings, the earthquakes triggered landslides across the Kyushu mountain range, leaving scars on the hillsides and forcing the collapse of the Great Aso Bridge into the Kurokawa River. This was an unprecedented event in the area's living memory. We already had several large landslides five years ago. They were declared national disasters and they caused a lot of damage. I'm not sure if these ones are bigger compared to the ones we had previously, but they are ongoing and huge rocks that had never moved before have fallen this time. You can see on the mountain areas that the soil is red as a result of landslides. On April 17, Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe mobilized 3,000 personnel from the Air Force to help local authorities reach impacted areas. I am part of one of the search and rescue teams. At the moment, we are looking for people who have disappeared. It is the first time that we have seen an earthquake and a landslide of this size. Since I arrived here, we have found four people. One person is still missing, so we are going to search all night. It is a natural occurrence, and nobody could see it coming. We have no warning. We don't know where the houses have been carried off. We are doing research based on assumptions. Time is running out to find survivors. The team prepares for a sleepless night. Three people in Yamaguchi, they haven't arrived yet. 
They've already gone down there. They've already gone down. And the last one, our one. OK, that's all. Now we'll go down. I'll lead the way. Are we on the list? Two people? Yes. You can come with us. We will leave the gear there, where the teams are waiting. The waiting zone hasn't been decided yet, so just leave it near the house. Dozens of people were pulled from the rubble in a desperate effort to find survivors before the forecast rains began. On April 18, 24 people were found dead. 11 were still missing and more than 91,000 had been evacuated. The number of people seeking shelter had risen to 180,000. As a result of the tremors, the entire city of Kumamoto was left without water. We're bringing in provisions using ground-based vehicles, as well as with helicopters from the Japanese and American armies. We're also providing water for the people. A lot of places don't have any access to running water. Part of our training involves preparing meals using very limited provisions. So that's also part of our responsibilities. By April 19, the continuing aftershocks drove even more local inhabitants to sleep in their cars, stadiums, and open spaces. Government officials estimate that more than a thousand buildings have been seriously damaged, with 90 completely destroyed. The epicenter of the first one was at uh, Mashikimachi, and then the second earthquake was in the Aso region. When the second earthquake hit, the house collapsed. It happened at roughly 1.25 in the morning. It felt like my body was being thrown from one place to another over several feet. I was just there, where the table in the living room is, under the clock. I was sleeping under the table because I thought it would be safer and that it would protect me if something fell on top of me. That part was two stories high and underneath there was the garage and my bedroom. It's terrifying to think what might have happened to me if I'd uh, been in my bedroom at the bottom. The car was squashed like a pancake. For the last five years, once a year, we have an earthquake of about three or four magnitude. I think it was a sign, a warning sign. Although the focus of the earthquake was underneath Mount Kimpu, to the northwest of Kumamoto city center, the worst hit areas were Mashiki and Mikubo in the eastern suburbs. Satomi Utumo's house in Mikubo was built on the fault line. Her future remains uncertain. Watch where you put your feet. I'm afraid. Yes, I'm very afraid. There have been a lot of aftershocks since the earthquake, and they keep continuing. So if I stay in the house and there's another aftershock, the house has been leaning over a lot since the last tremor, and I'm afraid that it's going to collapse. 
We were sleeping here in this bedroom when the earthquake happened. The quake made the furniture fall over and it was chaos. We were in a terrible panic. We tried to get out, but we couldn't get the door open. It was completely blocked. Eventually, we managed to escape through this little opening. We squeezed our way through. The only thing we had in our heads was our instinct to survive by getting out. My children's bedroom is just over there. And when I think about that moment, I was so terrified. I was very, very frightened. This is the kitchen. It stayed exactly the way it was on the day it happened. When the earthquake struck, all the plates and glasses fell out of the cupboard and landed all over the floor. The fridge was here, and it moved into the middle. Their shells were like that, but they've turned round. What a mess. I'd like to rebuild a new house, but I'm afraid of the future. If we were to rebuild it here, it's worrying because this land is on a tectonic fault, and there could be more earthquakes and aftershocks. I'm really worried about the future. For the moment, we haven't received any assistance. But we've been lucky because the people who live round here have been really kind to us. Every day they brought us food and have comforted us by listening to us. Thanks to these people, we've been able to come through the situation. We're all victims in this disaster. Here in the country, people help each other out a lot. If we don't have enough to eat, we invite each other to our houses. Those people's kindness has touched us really very deeply. And that's more important than money. Before the quake, the roof of the garage was joined to the house, but now it's all twisted. Here you can see the crack that appeared in the ground. On the 21st of April, as feared, bad weather arrived, adding to the rescue team's difficulties. The weather and the continued aftershocks contributed to the destruction of some of Kyushu's most significant cultural buildings. The Aso Temple was severely damaged in the quake. The temple, a Shinto shrine, and an important Japanese monument lost its tower gate and hall of worship. Rainwater runs into cracks, bringing with it the risk of provoking landslides on the unstable ground. The cliff is slowly collapsing because of the rain. The inhabitants of the houses living below the cliff have all been ordered to evacuate the area. We are actually in the process of checking if everything has been taken care of. The tremors went from the top all the way to the bottom. The tree is still standing for the moment, but it could break at any time. So we still need to be very careful. There could be more landslides, so be very careful. Among the most exposed were the houses around Aso, where the active fault moved the ground six feet sideways on April 17th. 
The building's foundations are now anchored into land that the earthquake has turned to soup. There's nothing we can do, faced with the power of nature. I comfort myself with the thought that there was nothing I could have done about it. There are only two of us in the house. We're thinking about living with other people now, even in temporary housing for a short period. All the houses here were destroyed the second day. The first day, the road started to worsen. Three pine trees and an electrical pylon fell on my house. My legs tremble with fear. <laughs> Around Asso, solid earth turned liquid, swallowing cars and roads, and even toppling buildings that had been resting on the weakened soil. This liquefaction has been the most destructive part of the disaster. Scientists have long tried to study the phenomenon, but now researchers say that many of their models are flawed and fail to accurately represent real world conditions. Liquefaction usually takes place in sandy soils. When the sand is mixed up during the tremor, the pressure means that the ground turns to liquid. That causes weaknesses in the ground, and the houses lean over, like that one behind us, because the ground can no longer support it. The ground here also has a particular geological feature, which is that it's covered with volcanic ash, which has built up on the sides of the mountain. Amidst the turmoil and confusion, a team of Japanese seismologists is taking measures in an effort to establish a 3D model of the area affected. They are trying to understand the region's tectonics and the forces in motion. If you look at this area over here, you can see that it has turned into a sort of staircase. The ground is very soft. I think that when large parts of the ground slipped, the surface kept on slipping, and it's not often you see a mountain collapse like that. We take photos of the zone every five seconds. We use the different angles in the photos we take to create a 3D model of the zone. In this region, several zones collapsed. First of all, we look at the complete photo before deciding where we want to do cross-sections. The measurements can be done by hand, but if we need different sections, we need to redo them. This machine is practical because we can move and see different segments. A fault line is clearly active here. And I think it's going to get bigger if the earthquakes continue. Japan is constantly under threat from new quakes and volcanic eruptions. The whole country is under the continual scrutiny of seismologists and volcanologists. 20% of the world's earthquakes hit Japan each year, around 600 per year. In 2016, another violent quake measuring 7.1 magnitude was felt on November 22nd in northern Japan, near Fukushima, causing more fear than harm. Altogether, the Kumamoto and other Japanese earthquakes of 2016 killed 49 people, 
and caused an estimated $7.5 billion of damage. A few months after the Philippine tectonic plate made headlines in Japan, another tectonic plate caused havoc in Italy. The Mediterranean basin is crushed by the African continent, moving under the Eurasian plate, which generates complex subduction faults. Trapped in the middle, the Adriatic plate rotates in an anti-clockwise direction at a rate of a tenth of an inch per year around the city of Amatrice and the neighboring villages of the Apennine mountain range in central Italy. The isolated mountain villages are known for their olive oil, black truffles, and vineyards. At 3.30 a.m. on August 24th, a shallow but strong earthquake measuring 6.2 magnitude took the villages by surprise. The towns of Arquata, Pritare, and Pescara del Tronto, among others in the region, were badly damaged. Local priest Francesco Armandi is the living memory of these villages. On the night of the 24th of August, at 3.36, to be precise, we heard a loud crash and the ground shook violently. I was in bed, but I was awake, and we had the impression that nature was trying to make my bed hit the ceiling. I waited until the end of the quake, and I got dressed quickly and went out. The streets were full of rubble, stones and big rocks. The whole population was in the street. I got up, I put my slippers on and got my son, and even before the first quake was over, we were already on the staircase. At the bottom, we realized that we were in our pajamas at 3 o'clock in the morning. When the second tremor hit, we heard the Mount Vittori. It made a terrible noise. At that moment, everything crumbled. I said to myself, Mamma mia. Not only that, we were just in the car park next door when we heard a noise of stones from the summit of Vittor that were rolling down with the tremor from the earthquake. In 10 minutes, you look around you and you see the disaster. My house is still standing, but you can't live in it. It's as though everything has come to an end. And looking at your village that no longer exists is even harder. The school bus arrives here. I've picked my son up here lots of times. I would give him his snack. We'd go to the bakery. That was our life. Simple, basic, but it was our life. It's gone now. I'm sorry. In addition to the loss of human life, some of Italy's important cultural heritage was also destroyed. A church collapsed at Pescarabi. It must have been a thousand years old, and it's never collapsed before, even though there have been other earthquakes, which must mean that this one was much stronger. These are not the colossal tremors we see at tectonic plate boundaries, where events occur measuring eight or nine magnitude. The effects in this region are devastating because the quakes take place near the surface of the crust. These small faults are shallow, causing dramatic shaking above the site of the quake. The truth is, we're just one little dot on the geographical map. In fact, we're just one little star. On the Italian Geophysical Institute site, they mark the epicenter with a star. Over 4,000 people were involved in the search and rescue operations, and 238 victims were pulled alive from the rubble by the timely intervention of the authorities.
earthquakes are like bullets in a game of Russian roulette. One can never be sure when and where they will unleash their destructive power. We realized that it was a miracle. Because at Pretari, apart from the damage you can see behind us, nobody died, nobody was injured. Then we saw Pescara. We rolled up our sleeves and we said, we're still here, we can do something. But what happened in Pescara was unbelievable. Unfortunately, the village was completely destroyed. In fact, if you go, you will find just a pile of ruins. There are about 50 deaths. These were people I knew. I had married them, baptized their children. So I'm also shocked because when 20, 30, 40 or 50 friends die, there is a lot of internal struggle and lasting pain. We will certainly have difficulty pulling ourselves together to start again. I lived through the earthquakes in 1972, in 1997, and the one in Aquila that we felt here because we are fairly close. But for me, they weren't as strong as this one. This time, it seems the earthquake followed a line, a cursed line, like Pescara, totally destroyed. But next to it, the village of Vezzano, which is less than half a mile away, was spared completely. Nothing collapsed. So these are phenomena that I, for one, can't understand. Can science explain such bizarre phenomena? The mountains are splitting apart and you've had a succession of earthquakes running from south to north, um, one after the other, weeks and months apart, as this, this, this set of forts, very well-known forts, forts you can go out and see running across the mountainsides in this region, which have had big earthquakes on them in the past hundreds of years. These forts have been, have been breaking one by one. Um, rupturing further north um, along the, the main axis of the Apennine Mountains in Italy. This is neither the first nor the last time that Italy will experience a big earthquake. Between October 26th and November 3rd, a series of 10 shallow earthquakes ranging from 4.5 to 6.5 magnitude hit the area of Maserata. They occurred on an active fault between the area hit by August's earthquakes and Umbria, which suffered in 1997. The process of faulting and destruction continues. Two hundred and ninety-eight people lost their lives in the August earthquake. The total cost of destruction has been estimated at two point six billion dollars. Italian magistrates have opened an inquiry into whether construction companies ignored building codes when restoring public buildings. This seemed to be the case for a school in Amatrice, which was reduced to rubble in the earthquake. A similar controversy is still raging on the other side of the Atlantic, where plate tectonics are responsible for one of the worst disasters of 2016. The Pacific Ocean, the largest and deepest ocean in the world, conceals a network of faults caused by plate tectonics, particularly in the west, where the immense Nazca Plate moves under the South American continent at a speed of more than two inches a year. In Ecuador, 
60% of the 16 million inhabitants live in coastal areas, including the country's largest city, Guayaquil. At 7 p.m. on April 16th, the earth rumbled and many cities lost power. It was only at daylight that the government realized the breadth of the destruction caused by this tremor. The earthquake took place in early evening, with the towns of Porto Velho, Pedernales, Manta, and Canoa among the worst affected. But the fact that the earthquake occurred at the end of the day, before people were sleeping, meant that there were fewer victims than there might have been. It was measured at 7.8 magnitude, the strongest earthquake to strike in 2016, and the largest earthquake to hit Ecuador since 1979. President Rafael Correa declared a state of emergency. 13,500 military personnel, police officers, and firemen were brought in to deal with the situation. I am the person responsible for the zone that was the worst hit. It's a shopping area that was in full swing when the tragedy happened. The rescuers arrived at all the critical points. For the first two hours, the firemen spread out over the whole zone and managed to save victims. There were a lot of survivors. Then we had to look out for the dead bodies. More than 600 people were killed in the provinces of Manabí and Esmeraldas, and over 6,000 were injured. The earthquake happened at a time that, thank the Lord, saved lives. People were still working, they were in the streets. If it had happened an hour later or very early in the morning, it would have been much more complicated. There would have been much more loss of life. It felt like somebody picked my house up and threw it on 40-foot seas, and it was going all over the place, you know, front and back and side to side. The wave arrived when I was at home, and I saw how the mountain could lift itself up. I also saw some of the buildings in town move. I saw the houses opposite rise up, collapse, and rise up again. Pedernales sits right next to the Plate Junction. This town of 40,000 inhabitants was particularly badly hit. Many of the town's buildings were completely destroyed. Our house is made up of five floors. By the time the aftershocks had stopped, as you can see, it was a big house. Five members of my family died in it. My sister, who is 17 years old, is still psychologically affected. She's really struggling because she saw the whole building collapse. And my mother saw the six-story building behind me collapse. It all just fell at once. It was completely destroyed. Some 30,000 people were made homeless. Water, gas, and electricity were cut in many parts of the region, and hundreds of miles of roads were destroyed. Many people's livelihoods have been severely affected. The pain will always be there. Years of work, loss of hair, white hair. Everything is gone. Nothing is left. 20 years of my life. We started with a small property a bit further away, over there. And then we moved and came here after many efforts and sacrifices. We were in debt for 18 years to pay for this construction. We just can't mess around with physics. The structure is twisted between the third and fourth floor. People were in shock. Everybody was sitting there watching. I was too. I, I felt shell shocked. You know, I was just sitting there and, and couldn't imagine how something like this could 
you know, could happen. But in the, the week since, it feels like we've got help. We've starting to get some support in the community, some uh, coordination, you know, that's the biggest thing is trying to coordinate everybody's efforts um, so we can get this place back on its feet again. Um, businesses are starting to open, which has been great. Um, people are starting to rebuild their houses, which is great. But um, we just want to, we're trying to work with the local government to make sure the building standards are where they need to be so something like this doesn't happen again. Ecuador, Bahia, and the whole region is a very active seismic zone. Throughout history, we've had seismic periods, and it's not over yet, and it's not going to change. The depth and precise area hit by the April earthquake are typical of those in a subduction zone between two large size plates. Such mechanisms produce the most intense earthquakes known. And where the earth has shaken, it will inevitably shake again, either nearby or at exactly the same spot. We see big buildings in United States and Europe, and we want to do the same thing. But here it's different. We should return to our roots, our ancestral values, wood, cane, bamboo, in order to live more sustainably and to respect the environment and to avoid future deaths. One of the things we could do to prevent the huge cost in terms of human lives, particularly in less developed countries, is to improve construction. With earthquake prediction, I think, is not working. The best we can do is we, is we can say, yes, we expect earthquakes to occur at places, at the plate boundaries, at places where we can see the big active faults. And that tells us we should make sure the towns and cities near those forts are built in such a way that when the earthquake comes, we don't know the day of the earthquake. When it comes, they are prepared. Their buildings do not fall down on people. That is the least of what we should offer for people, especially in rich countries. The most recent buildings sustained little damage. Those that fell short of earthquake resistant standards were destroyed, causing 673 deaths and damage worth $3.3 billion. Low construction standards of poor countries have been responsible for many casualties on the other side of the American continent. Our planet's weather systems are interconnected in ways that we are only just beginning to understand. This interconnection has set the scene for the worst disaster of the year 2016. The rain brought by the arrival of the West African monsoon is vitally important for African farmers. So the African monsoon this year was fairly active, a bit more than normal. This monsoon also heralds the arrival of what are known as tropical waves, at the origin of many Atlantic tropical storms. One such wave, which was to become Hurricane Matthew, left the west coast of Africa on September the 22nd. With environmental conditions favoring slow development and thunderstorm activity increasing, the tropical wave proceeded westward across the Atlantic Ocean. Matthew developed into a tropical storm 35 miles southeast of St. Lucia on September the 28th. The storm became a hurricane 190 miles northeast of Curacao on September the 29th, achieving category five intensity the following day at the lowest latitude ever recorded for a hurricane of this intensity in the Atlantic basin. Hurricane Matthew moved, started moving north and moved north quite slowly. Where it would make landfall remained a mystery. Cuba, Haiti, and Jamaica felt the humid breath of this monster and put coastal areas on red alert. At 7 a.m. on October 4th, Hurricane Matthew hit Haiti with winds of 145 miles per hour, becoming the country's first Category 4 storm since Hurricane Cleo in 1964. Despite preparations, the damage and loss of life on the island were catastrophic. More than a thousand people were reported killed in the aftermath of Hurricane Matthew, 
as hundreds of thousands of homes were destroyed. More than one million people were left in need of humanitarian aid, with damage estimated at nearly $2 billion. After ransacking Haiti, the hurricane headed towards Cuba. At 8 p.m. on October the 4th, Matthew made landfall near Huauco with winds of 140 miles per hour. Storm surge caused extensive damage in Guantanamo province, particularly the picturesque Spanish town of Baracoa, which was severely damaged. However, thanks to Cuba's efficient civil defense, no lives were lost. Land interaction with Cuba helped to weaken the storm to a Category 3, though Matthew eventually reattained Category 4 intensity as it moved away from Cuba and towards the Bahamas. On the 5th of October, Matthew made its third landfall over Grand Bahama as a Category 4 cyclone. Preparations began in earnest across southeastern United States as Matthew approached, with several regions declaring a state of emergency for coastal areas. Widespread evacuations were ordered for large parts of the coast. paralleled the southeast coast of the United States over the next 36 hours, gradually weakening while remaining just offshore before making its fourth and final landfall in South Carolina on the morning of October the 8th as a Category 1 hurricane. Damage was primarily confined to the coasts of Florida and Georgia, but 47 people died in the U.S. in Hurricane Matthew. On October the 9th, Matthew returned to the Atlantic becoming an extratropical cyclone as it turned away from Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. It's like a story which captures everything from the poorest to the richest because it hit the poorest, the poorest country in the region in, uh, in Haiti, caused uh, huge amounts of damage and loss of life, but then kept moving north. If the track had been 100 kilometers further to the west, there would have been a huge amount of damage in Florida from, from Matthew. But by the time it did make landfall in the US, uh, it had weakened, and so it was more of a, a flood event than a, than a wind event. So the, the US was fantastically lucky with Matthew. Haiti was fantastically unlucky. Over 1,500 deaths have been attributed to Hurricane Matthew across the Western Atlantic. And with the storm causing damage estimated in excess of $8 billion, it was also the costliest Atlantic hurricane since Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Not all countries are affected by natural disasters in the same way. There are big differences between the first world, between the developed world, where most, most of insurance is written in, in richer countries. Uh, people tend to build stronger buildings, um, better buildings. Um, they, they tend to follow the rules, the code, in how they build those structures. If you're working in developing countries, you may tend to find a lot more risk that things are not built so strongly. There's more building in the path of floods, for example. Uh, there's, there's less protection for people. And so there are very different challenges if you're modeling risk in the first world to if you're thinking about risk in the third world or the, the developing world, where, where the, the consequences of disasters can be much, much more critical to people's lives. 2016 has had its share of disasters. Fires. Earthquakes. Storms. Droughts. Flooding. 
But what percentage of these events can be attributed to global warming? We now have techniques in order to, to identify what is the cause. We, we, it's, it's called attribution studies. So it's done at a number of universities now where you run the world's climate uh, since 1950 in, in one version of the Earth where you have the increase in greenhouse gases year by year and another version of the Earth where there's been no increase in greenhouse gases year by year. And then you run these two versions of the Earth to discover how likely a particular extreme, it could be an extreme drought, it could be extreme rainfall, how likely that is in these two worlds. And that tells you how much climate change, how much global warming is influencing the occurrence of the extremes. One thing we know for sure is that natural disasters hit the poor much harder than the rich. If it can be recognized that global warming is responsible for at least some of the disasters our living planet creates, then we can realize the urgency of approving climate policies that protect vulnerable populations.